Theistic evolution critique. We're discussing front end loading and epigenetics this week. We've been reviewing the book, Theistic Evolution, a Scientific, Philosophical, and Theological Critique, uh, edited by Moreland, Meyer, Shaw, Gager, and Grudem. Um, and uh, we're still in the first part of the book. But before we go on, I want to point out something that the book makes explicit in the introduction, and that is there are several different ways of approaching uh, the uh, harmonization of science and religion. One of them is to go with something called young life creation. And there are several flavors of that, young life, young earth, young universe. Uh, uh, then there is what is traditionally called old earth creation, which would actually include young life, but usually, uh, as it's been classically presented, doesn't. Um, there's also ID theistic evolution where God never actually came down and interfered in gross ways, but perhaps helped things along a little bit. That's still an intelligent design perspective. Then there is what I would call non-intelligent design theistic evolution. This is where God, or you can't tell that God did anything other than maybe create the universe at the beginning. And of course there is classical atheistic evolution where the whole thing is all chance and no God, or chance and law and no God. Now, what this book that we're reviewing is uh, discussing in particular is non-ID theistic evolution. And they're not taking aim at ID theistic evolution, and that's an important point, and it will become an especially important point when we cover the first chapter we'll be talking about. Uh, the two chapters we're talking about today include uh, Stephen Meyer and Jonathan Wells' work. Um, the first chapter is by Steve Meyer, and it's in part one. Both of them are actually in part one, the scientific critique of theistic evolution. And it is, uh, they're both under the failure of neo-Darwinism. And the chapter we're looking at now uh, at first is the difference it doesn't make, why the front end loaded concept of design fails to explain the origin of biological information. Um, the summary, which is basically a, uh, an abstract of the uh, uh, article reads, insofar as theistic evolution has been formulated with enough specificity to qualify as an alternative to neo-Darwinism as a scientific model, Theistic evolutions have typically affirmed that God created the universe and designed the laws of nature. So God is at least deistic in a, in a sense, including their finely tuned features. So once he's done, I mean, well, he's, he's creating a finely tuned um, universe and you need no further explanation than that, which the atheists otherwise need an explanation. But having done so, they think that the origin of life and the origin of new forms of life can be explained by secondary causes, which they equate with the laws of nature and evolutionary mechanisms such as natural selection and random mutation. Thus their view in either entails the claim that the initial conditions of matter at the beginning of the universe and the fine-tuned laws and constants of physics contained all the information necessary to produce life, or it entails the view that the random mutation and natural selection or some similarly materialistic mechanism added significant amounts of new information into the bios biosphere since the Big Bang. Those are the choices they have. The problems with the latter view are shown in chapters two and eight. This chapter demonstrates scientifically that the former view cannot be correct either, despite the claims of certain theistic evolutionists who argue for a front-end loaded concept of design that they call teleological evolution. In this view, the information necessary to produce life was present from the beginning of the universe. This chapter contends that this front-end loaded concept of design is scientifically inadequate because it fails to recognize that the laws of nature do not describe information generating processes. And uh, the chapter begins Wherever you see green, especially green ellipses, you, that's where I'm skipping stuff. Um, 
As I noted in the scientific and philosophical introduction to this volume, the term theistic evolution can mean different things to different people. Some theistic evolutionists affirm that God actively directs the evolutionary process by, for example, directing the seemingly random mutations toward particular biological endpoints. On this view, God has actively created new organisms by directing mutational change to produce new forms of life. This view has the virtue for theists of being at least minimally compatible with the Orthodox Jewish and or Christian doctrines of creation, since it affirms that God is actively doing something to bring life into existence. On the other hand, this view contradicts the scientifically orthodox neo-Darwinian view of the evolutionary process as a purely purposeless, unguided, and undirected mechanism, a blind watchmaker, as Richard Dawkins has called it. Indeed, as George Gaylord Simpson, one of the architects of neo-Darwinism, wrote in The Meaning of Evolution, the theory implies that man is the result of a purposeless and natural process that did not have him in mind. Other theistic evolutionists see the evolutionary process, including both the origin and subsequent evolution of life, as a purely unguided and undirected process, just as orthodox neo-Darwinists do. These theistic evolutionists conceive of God's role as much more passive. They conceive of God as merely sustaining the laws of nature, which in turn allow life to emerge and develop as the result of otherwise undirected and unguided mechanisms, such as mutation and natural selection. While this view comports nicely with scientific materialism and neo-Darwinism, it seems to contradict religiously orthodox views of the creation of life by denying that God played any active role in creation or that he even knew what the evolutionary process would ultimately produce. Perhaps in an attempt to split the horns of this dilemma, some theists who accept the adequacy of materialist explanations have proposed a new view, or at least a new view with a new name. For example, Dennis Lamoureux, a pro professor of science and religion at St. Joseph's College, University of Alberta, advocates a position he calls teleological evolution or evolutionary creation. He prefers the term evolutionary creation to theistic evolution because, as an evangelical Christian, he wants to emphasize his belief in creation by making the term evolutionary merely the modifier rather than the noun in the description of his position. For him, evolution refers merely to the method through which the Lord made the cosmos and living organisms. Although the cosmos is an interesting thing to put there. Um, he prefers the term teleological evolution to theistic evolution because he wants to affirm uh, Contra Simpson, George Gaylord Simpson that we read before, and other neo-Darwinists, that evolution is a planned and purpose-driven natural process. But what example, exactly is meant by this idea, and does it provide an adequate scientific explanation for the origin and development of life? And if so, does it do so with enough specificity to be distinguished from standard materialistic theories of evolution and reconciled with a traditional Judeo-Christian understanding of God as the creator of life. According to Lamoureux, the theory of evolutionary creation affirms that the creator established and maintained the laws of nature, including the mechanisms of a teleological evolution. Lamoureux provides several illustrations to convey what he has in mind. For example, he suggests that God organized the Big Bang so that the deck was stacked to produce life. He also likens God to an expert billiards player who can sink all the balls on the billiard table in one shot. God needs no additional shots, no further acts of creativity to bring life into existence. Lamoureux also compares the process of biological evolution to embryological development in which an organism develops deterministically from a fertilized egg through time in accord with the laws of nature. So that gives you an idea of what he's talking about. Thus Lamoureux seems to have in mind a f kind of front-end front loaded view of intelligent design in which the initial conditions of the universe are arranged or designed in such a way that life will inevitably evolve without any additional input or activity of designing intelligence. 
As he explains, design is evident in the finely tuned physical laws and initial conditions necessary for the evolution of the cosmos through the Big Bang, and design is also apparent in the biological processes necessary for life to evolve. He calls this view sometimes evolutionary intelligent design. Keep that in mind. Although he uses the term intelligent design to describe his own view, he objects to the contemporary theory of intelligent design and indeed to any argument that implies that a designing intelligence played a role in the origin or development of life after the universe itself first originated. According to Lamoureux, to invoke a specific incidence of instance of intelligent design or divine action after the initial creation of the universe would imply a violation of natural law by invoking the activity of a god of the gaps. Intelligent design theory, according to him, this is a quote, is a narrow view of design and claims that design is connected to miraculous interventions, that is, God of the gaps miracles, that introduce creatures and or missing parts in the origin of living organisms. For example, parts of the cell, like the flagellum, are said to be irreducibly complex, and as a result, they could not have evolved through natural processes. Since this is the case, ID theory should be, inter should be termed interventionalistic, or interventionistic, design theory. Um, by the way, I would agree with that character characterization for much of intelligent design, but not all of it. Uh, three problems with the theory of an evolutionary creation or teleological evolution and its critique of intelligent design. Um, as you might expect, Stephen Meyer disagrees with Lamoureux's critique of the theory of intelligent design and his theory of evolutionary creation for three main reasons. And he'll go over them. First, I see no reason to assume that the designing intelligence responsible for life in the universe, whom I personally believe is God, necessarily confined his activity to the very beginning of the universe. He may or may not have done so. I agree with Lamoureux that the laws of nature were established and are maintained by God. I also agree that the fine-tuning of these laws in the initial condition, conditions of the universe provide evidence of, provides evidence of intelligent design. Nevertheless, I see no reason to assume that this fine-tuning is the only evidence of design in the natural world, nor do I think that the cosmological fine-tuning accounts for everything we find in the biological world. And he's going to argue that below. Of course, Lamoureux finds appealing the concept of a god who had the wisdom to arrange matter so exquisitely at the beginning of the universe as to make any future actions on his part unnecessary. As a Christian, however, I affirm that God acted entirely freely and was under no compulsion to act in a way that either appeals to or affirms our aesthetic sensibilities. So I think the question of when God acted should remain a matter for empirical investigation and should not be determined by our aesthetic or theological preferences one way or another. And I think that's an important point. Um, second, unlike Lamoureux, I do not think that materialist, material processes and mechanisms of evolution are sufficient to account for the origins of living forms, whether the origin of first life or the major innovations in body plan design see chapter 2, that appear during the history of life thereafter. I'm skipping over a bunch. Third, I think Lamoureux's front-end loaded view of design is scientifically problematic. I do so because my own study of the problem of the origin of first life and the critically related problem of the origin of biological information. In the remainder of this chapter, I would like to discuss this problem and show why Lamoureux's theory of evolutionary creation with its front end loaded view of design is insufficient to account for the problem of biological information as well as the closely related problem of the origin of life. The origin of biological information, the fundamental in mystery. Um, Steve Meyer begins with the familiar story of James Watson and Francis Crick discovering the structure of DNA. 
The information bearing properties of DNA can be compared to that of a digital computer code. And he notes, but if this is true, how did the information in DNA arise? Understanding Lemereux's view, pick your poison. Dennis Lemereux does not directly address the problem of the origin of the first life or the origin of the information necessary to produce it. Nevertheless, the metaphors he employs to convey how God creates the extract at the beginning, God is cosmic billiards player, evolution is embryological development, etc., imply that deterministic laws cause life to self-organize or self-assemble from some highly configured and therefore information-rich set of initial conditions at the beginning of the universe. Nevertheless, he does not say whether he thinks that A, all the information necessary to produce the first and subsequent forms of life was present in the initial conditions of the universe, or whether B, the laws of nature added new information during the subsequent self-assembly process. In any case, both proposals are scientifically problematic. So let's consider each in turn, starting with the second. The laws of information added new, uh, laws of nature added new information. Are laws creative? Lamoureux, like other evolutionary creationists, sometimes speaks as though he thinks the physical laws of nature might be generating the new information necessary to produce new forms of life. But new, do laws of nature generate information? There are good reasons to doubt this. The laws of nature do not add new information to that which is present in the specifically arranged configuration of matter or initial conditions at the beginning of the universe. Laws can transmit but not generate information. There's a deeper reason for this. Scientific laws describe, by definition, highly regular phenomena or structures, ones that possess what information theorists re refer to as redundant order. On the other hand, the arrangements of matter in an information-rich text, including the genetic instructions on DNA, produce a high degree of complexity or aperiodicity, not redundant order much like the letters that are on the screen right now. Skipping over about six paragraphs, um, we've heard this argued before. Does the configuration of matter at the beginning of the universe contain the or origin of biological information? So we're going to go with that first one now and discuss it. To be fair, Lamoureux mainly seems to have a different scenario in mind one in which the information necessary to produce living systems is entirely present at the beginning of the universe. Indeed, taken at face value, each of the metaphors he uses to describe this front-ended loaded view of evolutionary intelligent design emphasize how the deck was stacked at the beginning. Thus, Lamoureux's metaphors imply that the information necessary to produce the first and subsequent living forms is already present in the arrangement of elementary particles just after the beginning of the universe. But is this view scientifically plausible? Was the information necessary to produce the first life present in the arrangement of ele elementary particles just after the beginning of the universe? For this to be true, there must be a law that can transmit whatever information was present in the configuration of elementary particles at the beginning of the universe across billions of years without degradation, and also some process that can utilize that information or convert it into a medium that can be used to produce the first living cell. Since the first living cell would, at the very least, require genetic information, that raises two more precise and analytically tractable questions by which Lamoureux's proposal can be evaluated. They are, one, was the information necessary to produce a functional gene information-rich DNA molecule, present in the arrangement of elementary particles just after the beginning of the universe? And two, is there a physical law that could use the information present in the arrangement of elementary particles just after the beginning of the universe to produce a functional gene? In both cases, the answer is no. And there are important reasons why this is so. First, it turns out that even the biologically relevant chemical subunits of DNA themselves do not contain the information necessary for producing a functional gene 
or the functional information DNA contains. And if they do not contain such information, then the much more simple and less biologically relevant arrangement of elementary particles or distributions of mass energy present at the beginning of the universe certainly did not contain such information. Second, there is no law that describes how these units, self, subunits self-organize into functional genes. And I'm going to make a point that if, we, if there were, we should be able to demonstrate it. And we can't. Skipping on, what the structure of DNA reveals about the inadequacy of self-organizational models of the origin of life. And it's, this is discussing DNA and the fact that all four bases can, are acceptable and none is preferred in DNA. If there were, then you couldn't have, uh, you would have to have uh, repeating units all the time. Uh, Self-organization and evolutionary creation. If law-like processes of chemical evolution, uh, chemical attraction do not account for the specific sequencing of nucleotide bases, that constitute the information in DNA, as shown above, then such processes cannot reasonably be invoked as the explanation for the origin of the information in DNA in the first place. If they don't make it now, why should they have made it at the origin of the first life, when you need it? What does this have to do with the adequacy of the front-end loaded conception of design favored by ad advocates of evolutionary creation and other theistic evolutionists? Quite a lot. Evolutionary creationists such as Dennis uh, Lamoureux seem to affirm that the laws of nature are as established and maintained by God are sufficient to produce life from the initial configurations of matter at the beginning of the universe. Thus the evolutionary creationist position with its emphasis on the deterministic unfolding of the history of life in accord with pre-established conditions and laws of nature entails a commitment to some, sort, some form of self-organizational origin of life scenario. Yet self-organizational scenarios fail to account for the origin of genetic information for the simple reason that there are no self-organizing forces of attraction that can account for the sequence specificity of DNA and RNA bases, the carriers of genetic information in all known cells. Moreover, the irreducibility of genetic information to the chemistry of the DNA and RNA poses a particular difficulty for the front-end loaded evolutionary creationist views of Denis Lamoureux and others. The difference it doesn't make. In Signature in the Cell, I argue that intelligent design provides the best explanation for the information necessary to produce the first living cell. In the process of making that case, I critique the adequacy of self-organizational theories of the origin of biological information. Of course, neither self-organization nor intelligent design exhaust the logical possibilities for explaining the origin of information. One could also invoke contingency or chance of either the directed or undirected variety. And uh, he notes in Signature in the Cell, I show why these, those theories fail as well. He's not going to spend a lot of time with them. Unfortunately, none of these approaches involving contingency, chance or choice, re represent live options for Lamoureux, who wants to attribute the origin of life to deterministic laws, acting on finely tuned initial conditions. It was, it was going to happen from the beginning because God made it that way. If, for example, the teleological evolutionists wanted to avoid the information theoretic difficulties discussed above by invoking undirected chance variations, to help explain the origin of genetic information, his position would become indistinguishable from standard materialistic versions of evolutionary theory, which Lamoureux does not really want to be indistinguishable. On the other hand, if on the other hand, the teleological evolutionists invoke directed contingency, that is the active or intelligent guidance of events, then he would violate his own self-imposed injunction against invoking divine action as a cause during the history of life and would commit a God of the gaps fallacy. Although if you want my personal opinion, I think he should do so anyway. But that will be for another discussion here. 
Uh, thus, the teleological evolutionist faces a dilemma. Either he sticks with the empirically unsupportable and theoretically incoherent view that natural laws generate specific biological information, or he invokes some form of contingency to account for the origin of biological information. If he claims that undirected stochastic processes generate biological information, then he would undercut his claim of having formulated a novel purpose-driven theory of evolution. But claiming that directed contingency generates biological information would entail affirming an interventionist version of intelligent design that Lamoureux explicitly rejects. Thus, it's difficult to see how Lamoureux's proposal can be rescued at least on terms acceptable to him. Conclusion. C.S. Pierce's maxim for a difference to be a difference, it must make a difference, seems applicable here. Lamoureux proposes to offer a novel theory of biological origins, yet his theory is indistinguishable from self-organization theories of the origin of life that cannot, for good reasons, explain the origin of information necessary to produce the first life. Nevertheless, if Lamoureux were to modify his theory to overcome the inherent limitations of such a deterministic law-driven approach, any such alteration would make it indistinguishable from other established theoretical approaches that he rejects. And I would add, but maybe shouldn't. It's also unclear what difference his teleological approach to evolution makes. If the finely tuned arrangements of matter or mass energy at the beginning of the universe lack the information necessary to produce a single functional gene or protein, then even if God produced those arrangements, something else must be responsible for the additional information necessary to produce a living cell. If that something cannot involve the activity of a purposeful designing agent after the Big Bang, as Lamoureux insists, then clearly the process that generates the first life from that set of initial conditions cannot be teleological. All of which makes it fair to ask, does Lamoureux's specif specifically teleological theory of evolution add anything to the explanation of biological origins that is self-organizational theory, or were he to modify his theory, a more conventional you know, Darwinian or chemical evolutionary theory does not? Regrettably, the answer to this question is no. Since Lamoureux is unwilling to specify any role for God beyond the causal necessary but insufficient role of establishing initial conditions and maintaining physical laws, teleological evolution seems to be little more than an empty phrase describing a theory that in the end reduces to a standard and completely inadequate materialistic mode of explanation for the origin of biological information. And that is the end of Steve Meyer's article, and now we will get to Jonathan Wells, who will be talking about why DNA mutations cannot establish, ca accomplish what neo-Darwinism requires. And I apologize because the, the I, I'm just realizing that I didn't switch the heading. The heading should now switch to um, epigenetics, which is what we will be discussing. That, at this point. Instead of front end loading here, that should read epigenetics now. Um, summary of Wells's paper. According to Neo-Darwinism, evolution takes place because of the natural selection of some of slight successive variations. Some of these variations may arise through the reshuffling of existent DNA sequences, but for continuing evolution, Neo-Darwinism requires that existing DNA sequences mutate into new sequences. This assumes that DNA contains a program for embryo development. DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us. Mutations in the program could then produce novel anatomical structures and natural selection could preserve favorable ones and eliminate unfavorable ones. But DNA sequences do not even fully specify RNAs, much less proteins. And the three-dimensional arrangements of proteins in a cell requires spatial information that precedes their synthesis and is specified independently of DNA. Therefore, DNA does not contain a program for embryo development, and mutations in DNA cannot provide the raw materials for anatomical evolution. You need something more. 
The chapter begins, according to neo-Darwinism, living things evolve because natural selection preserves, un preserves favorable variations and eliminates unfavorable ones. But natural selection cannot create new variations. Instead, these variations are supposedly generated by accidental mutations in DNA. As critics have pointed out, however, accidental mutations in DNA, like accidental changes in computer programs, are overwhelmingly harmful. The DNA sequences that code for proteins are so complex and specified, like computer code, that accidental changes in them are exceedingly unlikely to produce enough beneficial variations to supply the raw material for evolution. And you've all heard that critique, and he says the critics are right. But there is a more fundamental reason why DNA mutations are not up to the job. Evolution requires changes in the information that directs embryo development, and much of that information is independent of DNA. This chapter consists of a brief history of how neo-Darwinism came to place much, so much emphasis on DNA, which I will make even briefer, followed by a survey of the evidence showing why that emphasis is biologically unjustified, and finally by a discussion, discussion of the implications for neo-Darwinian theory. Historical background. When Charles Darwin proposed his theory of evolution in 1859, the theory required a mechanism for organisms to transmit characteristics to their offspring. But Darwin knew of no such mechanism. In 1868, he proposed a theory of pangenesis in which gemmules, which is what he called them, throughout the body are supposedly carried in the bloodstream to the reproductive organs, where they blend together in the sperm or egg cell to be transmitted to the next generation. Remember, this is way before DNA, and so he had literally no clue as to what was going on. But this was mere speculation. There was no evidence to support it. The Secret of Life, in, in 1865, Austrian monk Gregor Mendel announced the results of some hybridization experiments using pea plants. Mendel studied the inheritance of seven traits, each came in two forms, and Mendel concluded from their pattern of inheritance that one form of each trait was inherited through the male germ cell and the other through a female germ cell. He also concluded that each trait was inherited independently of the other traits rather than being blended together. Uh, skipping on uh, through a whole history, talks about mutations and of course the discovery of DNA itself, and then finally he gets to the central dogma. When they published their model a few months later, after discovering DNA itself, uh, the structure of DNA, Watson and Crick noted that it suggests a possible copying mechanism for the genetic material. A month after that, they elaborated on this. Our model for deoxyribonucleic acid is, in fact, a pair of templates, each of which is complementary to the other. We imagine that prior to duplication, the two chains unwind and separate. Each chain then acts as a template for the formation onto itself for a new companion chain. It's a little awkward way of saying things. Uh, so that eventually we shall have two pairs of chains where we only had one before. Moreover, the sequence of the pairs of bases will have been duplicated exactly. Skipping down a little bit further, Norman Hor Horowitz dubbed uh, this the one gene, one enzyme hypothesis. Uh, later generalized to one gene, one protein, or one part of a protein, because, of course, collagen is not an enzyme, but it is definitely a protein, for example. Uh, in, in 1958, Francis Crick proposed that the specificity of a DNA segment lies solely in its nucleotide sequence, which encodes the nucleotide sequence of a molecule of messenger RNA, which in turn serves as a template for the amino acid sequence of a protein. Crick also proposed that the information encoded in DNA sequences can be transferred from DNA to protein, but not back again. He called the former the sequence hypothesis and the latter the central dogma. And it's interesting to use that term uh, of uh, molecular biology. Many writers since then, however, have used central dogma to refer to the two proposals together, a practice that is followed in the remainder of this chapter. Um, we're skipping on. So the central dogma simply stated is DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us. 
There have been many critics of the central dogma, and uh, he quotes one of them. Uh, Nevertheless, the central dogma has become very popular. One reason that it is consistent with neo-Darwinian theory, one reason is that it is consistent with neo-Darwinian theory. As Jacques Monod once said, with the central dogma and with the understanding of the random physical basis of mutation that molecular biology has also provided, the mechanism of Darwin is at last securely founded and man has to understand that he is a mere accident. The addition of that last line is just interesting. Um, now, there's lots of history behind that, and if you're interested in the history further, I suggest that you can look at the book itself. Which, if you don't want the doorstop, I think you can still get um, uh, copies of it uh, uh, through some of the... Uh, I'm trying to think of what they call them, the... Uh, yeah, e-books. That kind of thing. Uh, and then now he's going to discuss epigenetics. Yet all biologists, even those who believe in the central dogma, know that the path from the genotype to the phenotype is, ex- is affected by other factors. The Greek word epi means above, on, or addition to. In 1942, British biology Conrad Waddington coined the word epigenetics. Notice this is before we even had the, the knowledge of the structure of DNA. This is to mean the study of the processes involved in the mechanisms by which the genes of the genotype bring about phenotypic effects. And three years earlier, however, Waddington had used the word epigenotype to refer more broadly to the set of organizers and organizing relationships, relations to which a certain piece of tissue will be subject during its development. So there's been two kind of related meanings of epigenetics. And uh, they'll use both of them, as he explains in the next chap- uh, paragraph, which we didn't read. Uh, most biologists now use epigenetics in its narrow sense to refer to heritable changes in a chromosome that do not alter the DNA sequence. Um, and he refers to some of these mechanisms, DNA methylation, um, and then several different molecules can modify histones by binding chemically to them. You can get methyl groups attached, you can get acetyl groups attached, just some examples, thereby changing chromosome structures and affecting DNA transcription. Furthermore, there are several kinds of histones with different properties, and molecular chaperones can exchange some for others. So there's at least four mechanisms mentioned there. DNA methylation, histone modification, and histone exchange help to determine when and where Specific parts of a DNA sequence are transcribed into RNA, but epigenetics in this narrow sense leaves the central dogma intact. The broader version of epigenetics implies that there are layers of information in an organism that are independent of DNA sequences, and indeed there are. Why the central dogma fails? According to the central dogma, DNA specifies messenger RNAs, messenger RNAs specify proteins, and proteins specify the organism. Yet many messenger RNAs are not completely specified by DNA sequences, and many proteins are not completely specified by messenger RNAs. Uh, DNA does not specify many RNAs. After a DNA sequence is transcribed into RNA, several processes can modify the RNA so it does not match the original transcript. Two well-studied processes are RNA splicing and RNA editing. RNA splicing, I think most of us are somewhat familiar with, taking uh, introns out and joining the exons together. RNA editing, in addition to alternative splicing, Many animal transcripts undergo RNA editing, which can modify existing nucleotides or insert additional ones. The editing of a messenger RNA can alter the amino acid sequence of the protein it encodes, so that the protein differs from what the DNA sequence would have specified. Recent studies have demonstrated extensive RNA editing in humans, in us. RNA editing, like RNA splicing, has functional consequences, and uh, one of the more interesting ones is an octopus that changes its 
protein because of RNA editing. Messenger RNAs do not specify the final shape of many proteins. And it gives some uh, pointers on that. Most proteins are modified by glycosylation, giving rise to what is sometimes known as the sugar code. So the first two steps of the central dogma fail. DNA does not completely specify messenger RNA, and messenger RNAs do not completely specify proteins. But the central dogma fails most conclusively in its third and final step. Proteins do not specify an organism. The need for spatial information. After RNAs and proteins are synthesized in a cell, many of them must be transported to specific locations in order to function properly, like, say, the cell wall. In addition to their protein coding regions, some messenger RNAs have sequences called zip codes that specify the address in the cell to which they are to be transported. Like a postal zip code, however, a messenger RNA zip code is meaningless unless it matches a pre-existing address. So you have to have something to decode the postal zip code. Which makes sense. If you had zip codes but you didn't have post office people who could figure out which zip code went where, they wouldn't do anybody any good. In other words, biological membranes carry a spatial information. That information is mediated in part by a sugar code and a bioelectric code. And the sugar code, it describes in some detail, if you're interested, uh, the book will help you out and it will have references that will help you out further. But the bioelectric code is one that probably people don't know as much about. The cell surface code includes more than the sugar code. It has long been known that probably all living cells, not just nerve and muscle cells, generate electric fields across their membranes. It has to do with the sodium potassium pump, which interestingly is poisoned by digoxin, among other things. Um, manipulating ion channels that generate an electric field associated with eye patterning in frog embryos results in deformed or missing eyes or tadpoles with eyes located on the side or tail. So you do a, a little electrical manipulation and all of a sudden you've moved the eye. Which is pretty amazing if you think about it. And that's not specified by DNA, by the way. Implications for neo-Darwinism. So membrane patterns carry essential biological information, yet that information cannot be reduced to sequence information in DNA. Even if DNA sequences completely specify messenger RNAs and proteins, which we know they don't, the spatial distribution of proteins in the cell membrane must be specified independently, like addresses in the postal metaphor. So what specifies uh, membranes? Well, membrane heredity, and there's a, a several paragraphs on that. If membrane patterns are not specified by DNA sequences or membrane patterns in the cell from which they're derived, how are they specified? Well, mathematical approach to short answers, we don't know yet. But theoretical biologists have been addressing the problem mathematically, and they give some hints. Um, what is clear, however, is that neo-Darwinism fails to explain evolution, because you have to uh, alter the epigenetic stuff, too. Why neo-Darwinism fails? According to neo-Darwinian theory, DNA mutations supply the raw materials for evolution. If the central dogma were true, this might be the case. But the dogma that DNA makes RNA, makes protein, makes us, fails at every step. It is true that some DNA mutations can be beneficial to an organism in a particular environment. For example, the antibiotic streptomycin poisons tuberculosis bacteria by targeting their ribosomes and thereby blocking protein synthesis. But DNA mutations that slightly damage the ribosome can prevent the antibiotic from recognizing them. The surface no longer conforms to streptomycin. Although the mutant bacteria are damaged, they don't grow as well as the regular bacteria, in the presence of the antibiotic, they are better off than undamaged bacteria. But damaging a ribosome is very different from producing the beneficial new variations in embryo development that could supply raw materials for evolution. Biologists have searched systematically for mutations that affect the development of fruit flies, roundworms, zebrafish, and mice. 
The effects of such mutations always fall into one of three categories. Either the embryo manages to overcome the effects of a mutation and develop normally, or the embryo is deformed, often in grotesque ways, or the embryo dies. So to judge from the available evidence, mutating the DNA of a fruit fly embryo leads only to three possible outcomes, a normal fruit fly, a defective fruit fly, or a dead fruit fly. Hardly the raw materials for evolution. Now, um, I'm going to address Jonathan L. Wells' article first. Okay? Uh, I think he makes a good case that there is more to life than DNA. DNA is hard enough to get to work, my apologies for the S, properly without plan changes. Now we need to fix membranes, sugar codes, arrangements of cilia, etc., all without planning. We don't know enough about all these sources of information to make the detailed arguments we can make for DNA. Just like it is easier to argue that a paragraph exhibits evidence of intelligent design than the faces of Mount Rushmore, even though we know both of them are designed without having to be told. But we do know that there is a significant problem. Uh, fixing DNA will not be enough to cause evolution to happen. Now, um, going back to the first article, which is an in some ways a more interesting one, Steve Meyer makes a good case that the hypothesis of Dennis Lamoureux is defective. The question he raises is, where does the information come from? Self-organization does not work, and if it did work, it should be demonstrable, although that's what I say, not what he says. Other law-like processes do not work, and chance is identical to neither Darwinism which Lamoureux is trying to avoid, and does not work. As long as one insists that the process is outwardly indistinguishable from what would be proposed by neo-Darwinian evolution, no mechanism can adequately account for life. And I think Steve Meyer makes a good case for that. If I were defending Lamoureux, here's how I would do it. I'm going to play devil's advocate for a little bit, although not to imply that Lamoureux is the devil. But um, I would assume that the universe is deterministic. That means that we can go backwards as well as forwards, or more precisely, God can. Uh, we're not good enough to do that yet. And that means that we could say, well, if I need life at this point, then how can I uh, make it so that life would originate at this point? God knows that at a certain point, he wants a planet and he wants a planet with life on it. So he just runs the calculations backwards and then sets up the universe in precisely that way at the moment of the Big Bang and then just keeps his hands off and watches how it works. That would be the way I would see Lemero doing this. It's a thoroughly deistic God, but it's a God, well, except for the fact that he sustains the laws of nature as well. Um, but yeah, he does not interfere, so to speak, because he's already had it set up. Which means if you're going to use the billiards analogy, it's not God taking one shot. It's God taking gazillions of shots at the beginning, exactly the way he wants them, and then watching it happen. Um, now, that scenario would obviously be impossible for us because we don't have the computing power to figure out how we want the initial particles to go. But Lamoureux might argue that it is possible for God, and I suppose that I would have to say a God who is all-powerful could do that. Lamoureux would have to agree that design was evident in the way the universe unfolded in that case, because that's obviously not what would happen from chance alone. Now, I have a theo theological problem with that scenario, which is the same one that uh, Steve Meyer has. Why do we tie God's hands? If it looks like he intervened, why not say he did? We're going to have to do that, I think, at the resurrection, for example. Um, I have a practical problem with his scenario, and that is, do we know that the universe is deterministic? 
Because see, if the universe is not deterministic, if you can't specify that from certain conditions you will always get exactly the same other condition, then you can't set up the billiard balls to uh, bounce around that way. It seems, in fact, that quantum mechanics requires a non-deterministic universe. And if that's the case, uh, that's the scientific defeat of Lamoureux's uh, thesis. But I'm going to have to say that if Lamoureux would agree that one can statistically tell that God was involved and that mechanistic evolution of the standard variety is dead, then he is an intelligent design advocate. And maybe he doesn't like to be put in that category, but I think we're going to have to be honest and welcome him in anyway. Uh, just as a side note, Michael Behe has proposed front-loading genetically that the original organism had all of the genetic potential to create everything, including humans, giraffes, uh, pine trees, and, uh, and bacteria. Uh, and that what's happened is there's been a loss of information since. I have problems with his scenario too, but, uh, but it is definitely an intelligent design scenario. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes, Ariel. Is there any evidence anywhere of this front loading? Uh, I mean, empirical evidence. Um, well, like I say, if, if determinism fails, front-loading fails. Right off the bat. And my reading of quantum mechanics is that it does not allow for determinism. Um, the, other, the other problem I have, you know, theologically is if, you, if you're going to insist on determinism, it's very difficult to understand how you could have free will. But, you know, maybe Lamoureux is a Calvinist, in which case I would have to say that the, that theological argument wouldn't work for him. But I would think the scientific one might. Yes? Um, sticking my leg, I mean, I might get myself in trouble here, but... I, after hearing of all of about uh, the Steve Myers discussion, um, I am more convinced that almost totally convinced that the origin of life, we only have two choices. We trust the Bible and take it as it reads and trust God, the God of the Bible. Uh -huh. Or we can make up any scenario we want and say that God can, because God can do anything That's he right. wants, and we don't have all the answers. Stephen mm -hmm. Meyer tries to argue from that point of view, but he doesn't have all the answers either. So that's what it looks like to me at this point. Well, I would agree with you. You can, you can take the biblical account more or less uh, pretty much uh, the way the way you would read it, the way somebody uh, in uh, let's say fifteenth uh, century uh, 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 Israel would read it, or you can try to modify the theory uh, and, and put it in whatever context you want. Uh, the The part that won't work frankly, is trying to put it in a, in a system where there is no designer. And the fact of the matter is that the uh, evolutionists are well aware of that. Um, it, it was a subject which I, dis, which I studied and which convinced me that there was a God and that he was an interventionist God. And Yes, I suppose you could say that he arranged all the particles so that it would happen. Um, 
again, that assumes that there's no free will. It assumes that there's, you know, uh, everything is deterministic, which my reading of science suggests that that's not the case. Uh, but uh, it is it is a possible solution if you if you can swallow those two I ideas, um, but that there was nobody there, even setting things up, just as a, a nonsense hypothesis. And when I did that study, uh, my senior year in college, it was the point at which I never worried from then on that there was a God. There had to be one. Yes. I appreciate the path you've taken us on. Uh, I think, make, like many, I have real problem with a completely interventionistic type of in, intelligent design. Because if you go to that level, there's lots of blame to go around. Uh, so it, it becomes philosophically very, very difficult. Uh, and as you pointed out uh, clearly, if you go that far, then free will doesn't exist. So where is, uh, do, do we have a Monte Carlo effect somewhere down here at the lower levels? <laughs> Yeah, you know, the, the interesting thing is Monte Carlo is, of course, simulating randomness. But it's not really random. Understood, but still. Well, you know, one of the interesting things is, is I, I, I would love to converse with, uh, with Lemereux further to ask him a very specific question. Did God violate the laws of nature at the resurrection? Because if God did, did the things that ordinarily happen, resurrections don't happen. But as long as you ignore the second law of thermodynamics, you can set up so that this was in the card, so to speak, at the beginning of the Big Bang, and everything just happened to come in at the right time, and all the atoms reversed themselves and recreated uh, the alive body of Jesus after he'd been dead. You could do that. Well, that now, the problem is that if Abraham decided that he was going to walk here instead of there, then God has to plan ahead of time for that. So you can't allow Abraham free will. You can't allow anybody free will before Jesus that was remotely in the area. Well, the starting uh, theory for your discussion presentation today, uh, where it was all pre-designed from the beginning, is a lot more problematic philosophically because God planned all of these b bad things to happen. Yes, yes, that does raise we, those interesting questions. We, we do it. need a Monte Carlo effect, let's face it. Uh, in, order for, in order for God to not be directly responsible for evil, uh, you either need a Monte Carlo effect or you need a, or you need a, a, a malevolent intelligent designer. Exactly, As it was my next point. You have to have more than one factor involved in design. Yeah. We have a question here. Uh, just a minute. We want to catch this for posterity. So go ahead. For those of us who are not gamblers, will you please tell us, tell me what the Monte Carlo effect is? Um, Monte Carlo simulations, which have been used considerably in uh, uh, in mathematical very, very complex mathematical situations. Basically, what they do is they, uh, realizing that very small variations in random number, is, you know, in, in the original numbers can produce wild effects at times, and you want to have some idea of, of what they're doing, they just assign random numbers to the beginning, or semi-random numbers to the beginning of a complex calculation, and then they see what the uh, output is. And it, it's, 
it's sort of like there are, two, there are two ways of figuring out how a game of bridge could develop. One of them is to do the math to figure out all the different combinations that could happen and all the ways people could play it. And the other one is to play a bunch of games, let's say, you know, 50 or 100 games, or depending on how, how comprehensive you want to be, and you just see what kind of results you get. So what, what Monte Carlo simulations are is plugging those numbers in kind of at random and then seeing what kind of results you get. And, you know, this is absolutely necessary if your probability space is, let's say, of the order of 10 to the 150. Because if you do that, if you turn every single atom in the universe into a computer and ran this thing for uh, 50 billion years, you would not be able to simulate all the different possibilities. So you can't do it mathematically within any kind of reasonable uh, time frame. You know, considering that we don't have all the atoms of the universe and considering that our computers take more than one atom to build and, you know, you realize that we are scratching the bare surface. So if we're going to do any kind of simulation for, the, for those kinds of problems, you have to just basically throw in random numbers and see what, what results you get out. So sometimes a Monte Carlo is the only practical way of going. You know, when talking with students, uh, we kind of illustrated it, okay, Monte Carlo effect, you start your car. You expect certain outcomes, but one time when you start it, it shifts into reverse, full throttle. And there's nothing new about it. <laughs> they got the point. And, and, and you have to figure out why it went into full throttle and what do you have to do to stop that? If you can figure it, if you can figure it out, is it really Monte Carlo? <laughs> true, I'm sorry, true. I'm throwing curves. <laughs> okay, uh, bring the... Thinking a little bit about uh, trying to explain evil uh, in the presence of benevolent God and so on, uh, that issue. Uh, can a case be made that um, if freedom of choice is allowed, you can't blame God for everything? Uh, Although you may say, well, he created freedom of choice. But that's hardly an interesting uh, proposition. But no, uh, evil happened. Uh, and we have to go through this great controversy to prove how bad it is and, and uh, make a safer universe for a longer period of time. Well, that's certainly the, uh, what I find the most attractive uh, answer for the problem of evil. Uh, the one thing I think that you can't do with the problem of evil is say that it, it ruins a god. It might ruin a good god, but it doesn't ruin a god. Uh, the fact of the matter, and, and I think that this is important, and I think this is an answer that should have been given to Darwin way back when, when he made his complaints. Look, you don't like how things look, and I understand that, because I don't like how things look either. It's entirely possible that God doesn't like how things look in certain aspects. Uh, but the evidence of design is there whether whether you believe in God, uh, whether you believe that uh, the universe is totally fair or not. And in fact, what it indicates is that either you have a God that has two minds, a schizophrenic God, or you have an evil, <coughs> malevolent designer. Especially if the designs that look bad are malevolent. And 
you know, uh, hydrogen bombs are highly designed. They're intended to kill hundreds of thousands of people. Um, uh, even if you want to say the hydrogen bomb was there for a purpose uh, that was not essentially evil, which I kind of have a hard time with, uh, you would have to say that the people who fly hydrogen bombs in places where they shouldn't be um, exhibit evil because they're intelligently designing to use that thing. Um, and I think that you know the major the major defense of God should be that he is not the malevolent designer and that he did not create the malevolent designer he created something that was good that used its free will to turn bad um, I, I think that's the only realistic way you can defend it, but more importantly, I think it's the only realistic way you can account for the evidence. We, we face the reality of evil in the universe, but we also face the reality of good in the universe, and both of them are highly designed. And the only way you can account for it, um, if there is a good God, is that there's an evil designer. Which means that we get right back to the old traditional doctrine of the devil. And it's too bad that some parts of Christianity have thrown that away because that's, you could almost say, empirically provable. The, the one theological position that is destroyed by the existence of evil is that God's in his heaven and all's right with the world. You know better than that. Once the conversation drifts over into the area of free will versus determinism, then I can jump into it. <laughs> It's a theological issue, and I'm more familiar in that territory. Um, there, are, there are variations of determinism, as you know, and there are even variations of free will. So it's not all cut and dried, it's not always an either or. It seems like L Lamoureux is deterministic at the start of all things, mm -hmm. the first creative act. And then he can allow for a lot of novelty after that and some free will. Not totally, because all the laws, the laws that are set up determine boundaries. Mm -hmm. So that's deterministic. But he would like to argue for more free will than our book on theistic evolution would grant him. Um, that's point number one. Um, also, uh, at Calvin College, there was an astronomer, um, forget his name, who spoke of the fully gifted creation. Mm, you're thinking of uh, Cornelius Van Til's son. Van Til, uh, yeah. But, uh, Howard or something? Howard Van Til, that's it, Van Til. Yeah. Now, we know Calvin College is deterministic because it's named Calvin. after Calvin. <laughs> <laughs> we, and we assume anyone that works there is probably uh, more in the camp of, uh, you know, determinism and foreknowledge, not just foreknowledge, but uh, um, yeah. actually determining the outcome of everything. So um, I think Lamoureux thrives in the environment of determinism and Calvinism. Whether he is or not, I don't know. He may be straddling both yeah. camps. It's not always obvious, so we need to give him the benefit of the doubt that he allows for some free will. But see, if there is free will, uh, then determinism at least doesn't work for people, 
Mm -hmm. And it raises the question of whether it works for nature. Right. And with the evidence that we have for quantum mechanics, it looks like it doesn't work for nature either, in spite of Einstein's best efforts. Mm -hmm. That there are some variables that don't even exist until they're measured. True. But then when you try and measure them, they don't exist. <laughs> well, when you measure them, they pop into existence. Oh, yeah. 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 And so, uh, but as long as you don't measure them, they don't exist. Mm -hmm. and, and you can do some fascinating experiments with half-silvered mirrors and, right. Right. and stuff to where uh, you can demonstrate that until you get to the final measurement, you don't have, uh, you don't have an actual, uh, the beam, one photon goes both ways. Mm -hmm. and, and when you do the double slit experiment, you have one atom that goes both ways, which is composed of multiple, you know, protons, electrons, neutrons, whatever. Not only atoms, but molecules, large molecules. Molecules that you can uh, probably see under a really uh, intense microscope will go both ways through a slit, which just makes no mechanistic sense. But it makes mechanical, I mean, it makes mathematical sense. Right, that's free will. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so the idea that, the idea that, you know, everything is atoms bouncing uh, uh, off of each other according to sort of vaguely Newtonian laws, the, the billiards table doesn't work. Some of those particles disappear, mm -hmm. and reappear whenever. And uh, it would be, I mean, for God to, to do that kind of thing means that he has to not only know which way they're heading and how, what direction and how fast and everything, which is a violation of quantum mechanics as well, as mm -hmm. you may know. You can't tell the position and the, and the momentum of a particle at the same time. No, never. Which means you can't do the billiard shots. But beyond that, if some of them disappear, go one way or the other, and you, know, you don't know ahead of time which way they're going to go, unless you're God and you're making them go, in which case God is actually getting his hands dirty, at least at the quantum field level, mm -hmm. then why do we say he can't get his hands dirty at the macroscopic level? Mm -hmm. I'd like to add one more thought now, a little different direction. If you dip back into the 18th century thinking, before there's Darwin, before DNA, long before DNA, they had to try and explain how when you plant an acorn, you always get an oak tree. You don't get a walnut tree. You don't get a sunflower. You don't even come up with a mice, a mouse or a rat. But the thought, the idea then, as you know, was preformism, that the oak tree was already buried in the acorn. And presumably, if you had a microscope small enough, you could actually see the tree. Yes and it just unfolded. That's genetics before you had DNA. It's uh, homunculus is part of that. Yeah. yeah. It seems like what Lamoureux is doing is similar to 18th century thought, coming up with something that's buried in the whole universe in every atom that will explain the future course, which is somewhat deterministic. Um, now, I may be way off the base, and he probably wouldn't agree I think with me. Somewhat is not, not an unnecessary modifier. So he would probably, his way out is saying, well, we don't know all the information, just like DNA clarified that the oak tree was not in the acorn, you know, per se, but uh, in a very primitive way, it was in the acorn, in yeah. DNA. Yeah, that's although as, as uh, Wells points out, it's in the DNA and also in the cell and architecture And the cell around well. it, epigenetics, yeah. Well, that's all my thought today. I, I would just raise the question, and I, uh, I think Wells is probably right, but I wonder, he seems so dogmatic that DNA is not involved in this. Do we know the function of the genome that well? 
I think oh. that uh, if you were to put it that way, he would back off. I think he thinks the DNA is involved. I think what he's saying is the DNA uh, is not the sole determinant. And there I think he can make a reasonable case. Uh, just the, 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 where do the proteins go to? Well, they go to where the code says. Well, who reads the code to tell them, no, you go over here instead of over there? Well, obviously there's some kind of reader, uh, but the reader is already set up. Now, you could say, well, but the reader was coded for by DNA too, but you have to go several, uh, several uh, things down. And one of the things that was interesting is they've taken patches of paramecium skin and turned them around uh, so that cilia beat the other way. And those patches are inherited from generation to generation to generation to generation. So there is something in there that says, no, we want it organized this way. And that can survive the splitting of a paramecium into two. But you're not sure that DNA didn't have any function in that. Oh, well, we, t we, did the, we did the reversal ourselves and uh, we watch it continue on. So I'm not saying DNA doesn't influence it. I'm sure that, for example, all of the structures of DNA, uh, I mean, the structures of the paramecium are coded for with DNA. I'm just concerned about his absolute statement. Yeah. I, I think it's fair to say that we need more than just DNA to make it work. And we don't know much about it. A comment here and then back to Jack Stout. So there are several experiments and studies who have demonstrated that diet plays an important role on the phenotype and expression of the organism. So, um, yeah, so this is probably something that we should think about it, thinking that not only DNA, you know, uh, is responsible for a certain phenotype. Say in bees, for example, when bees are fed with different, these two different diets, the outcome are workers and queens. And that's beyond DNA sequence. It's just something in the diet that turn off certain genes that make this queen fully developed to perform its duty. That's right. And all you have to do is to feed some other, uh, some other larva queen jelly, and all of a sudden you have another queen. And so there's, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that's going on that's not just DNA. Uh, one. Um, for me, uh, the, you mentioned quant, uh, quantum mechanics and uh, the fact that observing, apparently requiring a conscious observer, uh, a process, uh, creates a process uh, is a major discussion in quantum physics at this point in time in which they there is there's a strong thread saying that the physical system is aware of our consciousness and responds to it when it's focused on it it's very hard to debunk that but it's and also very, tried. very difficult to strongly support it. Uh, well, I think part of it is that people don't want to believe that physics can respond to our ideas. I mean, the, you know, the thought that, that we actually control little tiny parts of the universe is just, physicists don't like that. Exactly. It's not too easy for any of us, however. Yeah. There, there are some very strange things. I don't know, this is perhaps a total non sequitur, but uh, in studies of uh, twins, identical twins, uh, you put two, twin, two twins in very different parts of a building who maybe across the street do an EEG on both, and when one blinks his eye, it causes a recognizable change in EEG. 
The strange thing is, in some cases, both twins experience that, even only one blinked his eye. Yes, yes, we, we still don't understand a lot. Part of it is that we're, we're too mechanistically minded. And we don't want to believe that one twin can influence his other through, you know, no. whatever other electronic things are it, going it's, between. It's them. interestingly much more probable with identical twins. It, yeah. They have found occasional pairs outside of identical twins that do yeah. something like that. You know, what would be interesting uh, is... This is certainly epigenetics. Uh -huh. What would be interesting would be to study long-term husbands and wives. <laughs> hmm. Do they actually become one brain? <laughs> hmm. <laughs> anyway, um, um, that's not one that, that most people would want to study. But you you know that you've you've been with uh, people who've been married for a long time, and they can like finish each other's sentences. It's just you know, it's unbelievable the the brain melding that goes on. Yes. Uh, my and probably everybody here, my favorite author uh, said that someone that you are married to, you should blend but not merge your minds into each other. <laughs> that one's individuality should not take over for the other and the other become totally dependent on the first one. Yeah, okay. Well, um, um, next week we'll be going to the next two chapters, and uh, I think in another two or three uh, weeks we'll be into common descent, which of course is one step further than just is there God and is his activity detectable, which is what we've been discussing so far. The thing I find fascinating is that the book is officially not supposed to be critical of theistic evolution as long as there's an, an a God who is, um, whose actions are detectable. I think Lamoureux gets attacked because he thinks that there's that there is that God does not actually step in and change stuff that he sets it up from the beginning with this kind of deterministic thing I think they're being too hard on him and I for example I, I think that when Francis Collins was saying and saying rightly I think that that God designed the universe that rather than saying, oh, but he didn't design life, so therefore you, uh, you're not an intelligent design person and, and we're going to be against you, I would have said, well, welcome to our club so far as you can get. I think that we make a mistake when we start chiseling people off from the right view. I would, ju I would just add this, this uh, comment to that. Uh, I'd like to talk to Lamoureux about He's closer to a recent creation by God where everything is done at once. Yeah. Uh, than over yeah. there. I'd just like to see which way he'd go on that one. It would be interesting to see. Well, especially, the thing of it is, what's keeping Lamoureux from being a creationist is the 600 pound gorilla. That is, you have to believe what science says, and science doesn't allow that. If we can get him to break with the 600-pound gorilla, it'd be interesting to see where he goes. Yes, the fossil record, Yeah, well, that's... The flood will take care of that. That's right. <laughs> anyway, you had a... Yeah, I, I have a question. First of all, I want to very thank you very much for this class because I've been looking forward to a class like that, and I hope I can be included in the discussion further on the emails. Anyway, but my question is, in this... Um, scenario of Lamro that you presented in this deterministic scenario, do you think that he allowed time or the option for error if God would have planned from the beginning all the way through history and the outcome we see now, does he imply that 
you know, in this deterministic scenario, error was also a chance or not? Because if so, then we have to say that God also planned death, which wouldn't be related to sin, which would make Christ's sacrifice totally in vain. Um, that's an interesting question. I, I will say that there are some people, and Calvin seemed to be one of them. Um, I'm not sure Calvin was totally Calvinistic, but, but he certainly sounded like he was. Um, that, you know, the, the devil is God's creation. Everything is God's creation. And, uh, you know, if you don't like it, that's your problem because God's sovereign and you're not. Um, uh, and I don't know how comfortable Lamro is with that kind of way of looking at things. If he is, then you see you could have everything deterministic from before and it wouldn't be that much of a problem. And, and God creating the Big Bang and then having life sort of organize what looks like self-organization but what is really designed way back when, when the first atoms were scattered across the universe. Um, and the, you know, the only real question is then, well, what about Jesus walking on water? It's theoretically possible. All you have to have is 50.01 or something like that percent of the atoms going up instead of down and you can support weight. Um, so was that what was really going on when Jesus was walking on water? And those atoms were programmed from way back when to do that just then and no other time. Uh, you can make that. Uh, but then again, at that point, you can't have anybody doing anything unusual that wasn't planned on. Because, you know, if Abraham leans his head one way instead of the other way, why suddenly you move some atoms of air which bounce off and hit some other atoms which, uh, you know, you lose your billiards effect unless, unless you have absolutely a perfect table. And so that's why th there's that difficulty. And I don't know whether Lamoureux has wrestled with that and what he would do if he did. Uh, it would be nice to give him an opportunity to see what he would do. Maybe he's closer to us than we realize. Anyway, see you next week.